It was my first Ozfest, my first full Ozfest. I had uh, Phil Anselmo walked up to me. How you doing, Phil? He's like, what kind of vocal process should you use on stage? And I said, I don't. I use a Beta 58A, man. And he said, no, you don't. What kind of vocal process would you use? And I said, I'm about to play. Come, come watch. And so he came, he watched from side stage. Uh, after the show was over, he goes, okay, fine. You don't use a vocal process. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I need music gear, I always go to Sweetwater.com. If it's mics, headphones, or studio and recording gear, Sweetwater has you covered. Next time you need any music gear, support the podcast by using the link in the description and comment section below. Party, you don't smoke, you don't drink. Uh, I I smoke weed on occasion, but no, nah, not not really. Um, I I I always had found that it um, for me. I just I never could process it really very well. I just mm -hmm. I wasn't very good at it. So like I literally was known amongst my friends as like the lightweight champion of the world. With two drinks, man, I'm ready to go home. You oh, know, that's sick. <laughs> yeah, like, when but I'm also drinking like you know whiskey, you know, on the rocks, you know, straight. So. Not like that. But they're doing shots and they're drinking and all kinds of stuff. And I'm just like, I can't keep up with you guys. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, But also I'd wake up the next morning and I know I, I want to go to the gym or I want to go hiking. And I'm just like destroyed. Just destroyed. After your, so. after your two Scottish whiskeys. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. So I, I, don't really, I don't really drink. I don't really do any of that. And, you know, uh, even like studio stuff, like I've had people come in. It's like, oh, I need a beer. And I'm like, no, you don't. You can drink that out later, you know. After. Cause, yeah. Because to me, it's like, you know, if, if you have to drink to, and this is just my opinion. It doesn't mean that it's right, but it's just my opinion. But, and my experience with certain people. If they've got to use drugs and alcohol to write music or create art, mm -hmm. then that's what's creating the art, you know. Oh. Um, to me, like we should be like... Buddhist monks or something like we should always be, you know, working on our craft so that mm -hmm. it's just there. We don't need something to help break down the barriers or hmm. find that well of inspiration. It should come from us, not from us, yeah. liquor or whatever, you know, weed, whatever. Yeah, that that's always like the mystery when I, I look back or I think when any of us look back on like a record, we're like, okay, you you hear the stories and I'm, okay, but I'm always curious. Okay, what what was the order? Mm. Right. Okay. Are they, you know, is Otep writing, and is her band writing sober? And then you do the studio, and then when and then when you're done there, then okay, we'll go out and now now we're raging this, and then then the stories happen. So I'm always curious when when that order, and what that order is. Tip. Uh, it, it just depends, really. I mean, I I, I like to be around uh, like creatives. You know, I, I mm -hmm. like to be around creative people who challenge me, challenge, mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully I challenge them. So. Uh, if they bring in a riff or a beat or, you know, something like that, then we can start working on that. But I don't know if they if they wrote it and while they were drinking or smoking, then they might have done it at home, but they didn't do mm. it in front of me. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So really, it's kind of, there's no rule book, really? No, not really. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll usually have some idea about what I, you know, I have, a, I think, slight hypographia, which means I write all the time, like on everything I've got bags and bags and bags of just little pieces of paper, cocktail napkins, whatever I can find, I just write on sometimes when it when it comes to me. And so I'll bring all of it in. And they call what I think they're calling me producers call me analog now because I write things down. I don't just put it in my phone. Mm -hmm. I couldn't write a song on my phone. I don't know how. Uh just different era. I like the tactile experience, you know, of writing lyrics and ideas mm -hmm. down. But I'll bring things in and I'll 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 usually set all my books out in a circle on the floor. And then if they start playing something, I'll be like, oh, I got something for that. And usually if we're that, if we have that kind of spiritual intercourse between us, that kind of connection, that energy exchange, mm -hmm. then we're already on that, on the same page. So they might bring something in that, um, that already sounds like something that I had been thinking about because we already are on, like, the, we already inhabit the same planet of creativity, mm. you know. Okay, cool. Yeah. Guys, it seems like your band started, like, with no rules at all. Like, so, <laughs> so, so your band started with no musical direction at all? Uh, not, well, no, not really. I mean, we, we, well, 
we had several ideas of what we thought we were going to be. Okay. Um, but there was the only rule was there are no rules. Yes. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm from new metal, right? The new metal world. And I carry that moniker with pride because cool. we, you know, um, whoever came up with that, like whoever came up with grunge, it wasn't. It wasn't the musicians, it wasn't the bands, it was yeah. some, you know, writer, you know, music writer or something. Same thing with new metal, you know. They they came up with those labels. And so um, for me, uh, like, I, I first met my drummer, Moke, Mark Bistany. He's from Boston, so he has mm-hmm. a really thick Boston accent. So Mar- Mark becomes Moke. Mm-hmm. Mark, Moke. <laughs> okay. So um, he had, um, he's one of the best drummers and probably least known, but... W- uh, really had done so much for the um, for the music industry. I mean, he he did he could play anything. The cat used to like go into sit in studios with Dre and lay down hip hop beats just all day. Just sit there and mm. just lay down beats, and Dre would take what he wanted and use them in songs. And and so, but he also could play metal and he could play rock and he could play punk. I mean, he just so when I met him, he was really instrumental in like. Our, the bonding of like what we were doing because at the time when I first started the band, um, I was make I was like, I, I mean I was into poetry you know and spoken word and stuff like that and I liked uh, Rage Against the Machine and I liked Slipknot and I like Corn and Deftones and so and East Coast Underground Hip Hop and like how do, and the, the beat poets so Kerouac and Ginsberg and how do you bring all those people together and um, that's what it was instrumental with Moak and him bringing in the bass player, Jay McGuire, and then bringing in um, the guitar player, Rob Patterson. And, and again, um, the bass player was Berkeley schooled and he's jazz bass, but he could, but he was also into Meshuggah and like weird yeah. time signatures. And so it was really this wonderful blend of everything that we could do. And the first time that I ever unleashed um, a, a roar the whole, the whole band stopped playing like they just stopped and so um and they were just like what what was that no it was just an emotional response to where the music was building it was just a crescendo and it just happened and so they they were like we'll do it again you know if you can I was like, I can so we did it again and I did it again and then that kind of like set us on the path of like what we were going to do you know we we're going to sure okay we'll we'll have like like trick on the first album a speed metal riff with uh, blast beats and me rapping over it and screaming trick in the, you know, roaring trick in the, which stands for the revolution is coming um, over the over the song. And so we did that and it, it worked out great, I think. And 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 I've I've never I've always entered with this, you know, my ninth album now, The God Slayer just came out and um, uh, everything that I do uh, is from that perspective. Like I just. I just want to make music. I don't care about genre. That's a limitation. That's a a, a border, a continent that someone else created. Mm-hmm. I, just, I just create music, you know. Did you have any experience with uh, singing prior to that? No. That that day, nothing. No, I had I had experience um, in oration, uh, speaking like speaking like spoken poetry, spoken mm-hmm. word pieces, things like mm-hmm. that, but. No, I, I I didn't I didn't sing in the choir. Or I wasn't in any other bands before this or anything. It was just you, just happens. Did you do the uh, spoken word poetry on stage? Um, before that, in, uh, in little tiny like you know clubs and stuff like that. But no, you know nothing nothing of substance really. The first time I ever did anything big with spoken word was when I was on Deaf Poetry on HBO, mm-hmm. and uh, that was my first time. Ever and there was a, and at that time like spoken poetry was a big thing and, and like mm-hmm. comedians do they do like the circuits and so uh, I had one spoken word artist come up to me and he said uh, so what what you know I've never seen you on the circuit before what clubs have you played and I said oh, I'm a musician this is my first one he goes so you're doing the, your first one is HBO Deaf Poetry so you just play the Super Bowl without ever playing a game before and I said well I do this on stage in my shows. Um, so I guess, and they were just, they did a prayer circle, which, you know, I don't really care about, but they didn't invite me, which was like, okay, I see you guys mm, yeah, are tribalistic. Yeah, sure, All it. right. So I had this, uh, Capitol, I was on Capitol Records at the time and, uh, they had sent down somebody from publicity and the guy saw it and he got really offended. So he said, come here, oh, come here, come here. He's like, play along. And he grabs my hands and he's like, 
old dark lord Satan, we pray to, you know, and then everybody in the room was like, oh my God, she's a Satanist. And I'm like, you know, just to scare them. And, and you know, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. I was like, a label guy's doing this? Well, all right. Um, but prior to that, no, I, 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 I'd, been on, I'd been on stages before. I spoke at like, you know, rallies and, and did spoken word stuff and did ciphers like with hip hop and, uh, you know, battle ciphers, stuff like that, little things. Because that is, that just looks terrifying. It's, just, it's only you. Like, there's, that, there's no wall to hide behind. Like, you don't, you don't, you don't get a banner behind you. You don't no. got nothing. It's, and it, it is. Because, one, they only give you, uh, I think, two minutes and 33 seconds to, and they, but there's no clock. There's no clock provided. So, um, Most Def was the host. And Most Def, if, uh, if a lot of people don't know, he's this, like, legendary hip-hop artist legendary lyricist and he's one of my favorite inspirations and he was the host so I got to stand in the wings with him and I'm just thinking like oh god don't mess up don't mess up most deaf is here most deaf is don't here mess up. don't screw up and uh <laughs> I still do that <laughs> yeah, I, 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 me too yeah I know I, me too um but it's a little more intimidating like when you're you know the guy's there yeah, right right there so he's standing there and then I, I walk out they introduce me I come out and it's quiet as a church and the stage is only about eight inches off the ground. So, and the crowd goes around you. So you go way out to the front of the stage, but you got people behind you watching your back, watching your sides, watching your front, people up there. And it's just quiet, right? And then they've got the, they got the, 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 cam the boom cameras that come down and they've got, you know, and somebody's working that and they've got the other cameras all in your face. And you just, you just got to get your, yeah, <laughs> you just got to get your, uh, get your poem in as quick as possible. And, and when uh, I started, again, like there was like a few giggles. Uh, to this day, um, uh, as long as Deaf Poetry was on air, I was the only rock artist to ever trans, like, transfer over into that world. And I'm very proud of that. But when, uh, yeah, so <laughs> there's most, that's like me. Like, walks off. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like slapping most Deaf's hand and he's like trying to whisper something in my ear, but I'm so like, like I'm what? full of adrenaline at that point. What do you say? You, you... He said that was so real, and then I was like, "Thanks, man!" And I just like <laughs> ran on stage as fast as I could. But like I said, I walk out. It's quiet, and it's like uh, there's a few giggles and stuff in the audience, you know. And they're like, "Who's this girl?" You know, this wearing this, you know, skeleton hoodie or whatever. And I come out and I start doing this thing, and it's it's autobiographical. I mean, it's uh, what I say in that poem actually happened um, in my family, and. Um, Everybody was still kind of like, because I start off and I'm doing like this little rap. You have seven more seconds to decipher your life before my, my tongue becomes a knife and your brain gets sliced. And everybody's kind of like, what is that? What is that? And then I get to the point where I talk about like, you know, I was born, you know, I was born at seven months. I was born two months premature, um, three pounds, four ounces. And then I, I show why is because my uh, protein donor uh, uh, of the biological side, um, uh, tried to abort me, punched my mother three, three or four times in the stomach while I was, she was seven months pregnant. So I illustrate that on stage and you can see I'm about to do it. And the microphone is here. So I hit myself so hard. You hear a boom, 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 boom. And then it's like gasps oh, in the audience. Oh, this is, this is intense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, welcome to my life. Yeah. So, um, there's gasps in the audience, and then there's, I can feel the tension lower, and I finish everything, and everybody's applauding. Most Dev comes out, and he's like, that's so real, and he actually, they stop it on this video. They stop it before he finished what he was saying. He was talking to the audience, like, that was so real, and he actually had a tear in his eye, and I was surprised because I didn't think, and like um, Black Thought from The Roots was on that show that night, and he came up to me afterwards as well, and uh, again, he's a, a lyricist that I'm really fond of, and he came up and he was just like, before the show, wouldn't talk to me, after the show, he's giving me pounds and dab and everything, and so uh, then all the poets were clapping, and before they were very standoffish, and uh, um it was it was an amazing experience that that was really one of the highlights of my career and, and I did it it was in New York City and I did a I had a show that night so I went over to uh, to do the sh I, they brought a car I went over did the show then went, drove back and did a sh did my show that had a night show that night yeah you, the Webster Hall you must have been 
just pumped with this adrenaline. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, they got a, New York got a great show that night because I was I was really excited about it. I was really happy. I was really proud of myself because it's really hard to do that. It, um, a couple of the other poets who were were much more experienced than me ran out of time. And so you have, like, the producer, Stan Latham, who's just a, an amazing human being. I'm still friends with him today. Um, you hear him come over, like, the voice of God. You know, he's like, you ran out of time. Cut. You do it again. And she's, like, the, she's crying. And, you know, they're getting her back together. And then she does it again. And, you know, without, you know, I, they should have put a clock up there. You know, that's what they should have done. So you know how much time you have left. And so because they tell you, don't stop for applause. So even when I get... Like in a, a round of applause, I just you just keep talking because you don't want to get cut off. I don't want to do that whole thing over again. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, that's like a so, one-time thing. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I can only imagine what you go. You're like, what? So, what are you thinking about? And are you, because I because you even like talk about it with your with just performing with Otep. Mm. Like you you kind of re relive those those moments. Yeah, yeah. You have to. I have to. I mean, I'm not an actress. I wish I was. Uh, well, not right now, but because of the strike. But I wish I was an actress. Uh, they, I did act in a couple of things, and man, they get paid a lot of money to do what we do, uh, but not at the same level of intensity that we do, that's for sure. And no disrespect to actors, I'm just saying, y'all got to give some love to musicians, man, and singers. But um, when I'm on stage, I have, I, I have to summon all those emotions that either cause me to write the, the lyrics, whether or not it happened to me or not, or it's just something that I, I saw mm -hmm. or uh, want to share. Um, and, or if it's something that really happened to me and those, that's real. And sometimes I think maybe some people misinterpret that, that I'm, you know, after a show, if I'm still on fire or still full of emotion or sadness or grief or anger or what, or joy, tri triumph, you know, um, uh, you know, they're going to, they may get a sense of that. You know, I've had people say, well, she was very nice after the show. And I'm like, mm. Do you see what I just did? Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> give me five, like, give me five minutes and then I'll like, catch my breath and I'll be nicer, you know. Um, but that's usually pretty rare that people have those kind of comments. Otherwise, people kind of understand what, what goes on up there. And it's usually a shock to the musicians, for sure, because they're usually just up, right, you know, a lot of them are just used to getting up there and playing and, and like it's a song and that's it. And our shows are not like that. They're, they're more, um, it's, it's. For me, it's like living art is what it is, you know. Yeah, sometimes uh, you need you need to mentally come back. Yeah, and you, you can't just like some people. I, you, you see like more all, all kinds. You see like the version of like they could. It's like this on and off switch. Mm -hmm. I'm like that's fucking freaky. And yeah. some you like you need like time <laughs> yeah. to like you, you need like a light like a like like, like a wind down period. Yeah. Sometimes it could be all night. Yeah. Sometimes you know what I I I gave it all out there on stage. I'm. I'm going to sit here. Especially if you're doing multiple shows in a row. And, yeah. uh, you know, for vocalists too, like, I've got to save my throat for the next show. And mm -hmm. I, so, you know, I can't be very vocal. You know, I, I, I that's the reason why I, I usually just, I'm either, I'm never at the venue during the day, I, except for sound check. I usually go to the gym where mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't talk to anybody or anything, you know. Good. And then uh, uh, I come back and then I, I get ready for, I take a nap and then I get ready for the show. Maybe walk my dog. You know. Oh, tip! You're ripped right there. Yeah. When did you start going to the to the gym? Um, geez, I started. Um, I mean, I've always been an athlete, but um, I started powerlifting when I was um, oh, geez, probably 2010, 11, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and and I fluctuated up and down. Sometimes I went I went for mass, so I was bulking up, mm -hmm. and that's what that photo was. That was me. Uh, I'd bulked up and then I, I shredded down. So it was a, it was good. And then, uh, and, uh, right now I'm in a transitional phase because one, uh, my eldest brother passed away, um, in a year and a half ago. And, uh, at the same time, um, my, my companion animals are like my children. So, um, I had a little five pound chihuahua who thought she was a Rottweiler. Her name was Chloe Commando. And, um, she, um, developed heart, heart failure. So at the same time, my brother passed away unexpectedly. And that's the last voice you hear on, um, the new record, the God Slayer. If you wait long enough, it's his voicemail that he left me the night before he died. And, uh, I didn't want to forget his voice. So that's why. That's what it was. Yeah, I wanted to. Well, I wanted to memorialize him too, because he he was always so, he was always so supportive of me and my music. But um, I've lost a lot of people, family members, and and in my life, and I don't 
I try to think back. Like my grandmother died on my birthday when I was 13. I can't remember her, her voice. And so when John mm-hmm. passed, my brother John, when he passed, I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to make sure that, one, everybody heard him and how amazing he was because it's such a supportive voicemail. It's so beautiful. And that's just, that's how he was all the time. He was a serial optimist. And, uh, um, but also I didn't want to, you know, if voicemails get lost, you, you lose your phone or whatever. I didn't want mm. that to happen. So I wanted to make sure that I never forgot not only the sound of his voice, but the intonations, how he spoke, you know, the yeah. different ways he talked and what words he emphasized and things are very unique to him. Um, but anyway, uh, at the same time, after he passed away, then my dog got really sick, my daughter, actually. Uh, and so I couldn't, I was, I was just in the house with her and dressed all the time because she had to go to the emergency room in the middle of the night or whatever. I had to just jump, throw oh, shoes yeah. on, it's race tough. there. That's so totally I, tough. I gained like 45 pounds. Yeah. 45 pounds? Because I wasn't, I wasn't leaving. I wasn't doing, I didn't leave the bed. I didn't leave the bedroom hardly. So What, what, no, what were you eating? Pizza? No, 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 Vegan no, pizza? no. I was, uh, <laughs> my, uh, I, I was, I was just eating whatever I could, you know, quick, quick stuff. A lot of protein shakes, but also just anything that was quick and easy that I could just eat uh, while I was in bed with her and just something I could just, you know, so, but, you know, atrophy itself is a big deal if you're not moving around a lot. And totally. then also just, you know, throwing food down my face to make me feel better because I'm like so worried about her. And so I, now I went through that and am trying to build back up all the the gains that I lost when I was taking care of her and grieving my brother. So right now, uh, I'm I'm going for uh, I'm slimming in my slimming phase, and then I'm going to build back up into my into my power phase. Yeah, work on work on your foundation. Okay, now we're, yeah. we're ready to come back. That's right. Yeah. Were you uh, Were you born in Texas? I was in Austin, Texas. Austin, right? Mm-hmm. When did you make the move, and why to LA? Uh, well, my family, I have family in California, in Los Angeles, Long Beach, uh, mostly Long Beach. And um, I liked it here a lot better than Texas. No disrespect to Texas, sure. but it's just the cl- the weather's better for one. Mm-hmm. Um, but also I just, I found um, there was, a, I, I was the only artist in my family and um, at least the only one that was interested in artistic things. Um so when, but out here it was different. There was a lot of like, there was art everywhere. It was just like in the air. So I kept running away and coming back to California. And uh, I, again, my older brother, John, who passed away, he did the same thing. Uh, we borrowed a car and drove out borrowed. here. We yeah. borrowed it. Yeah. yeah. The owner didn't, the owner woke up the next morning, found a note. But um, <laughs> oh my goodness. We, we borrowed a car when I was, uh, yeah. And, young and he was a teenager and so we drove out he over, out to LA and we lived out here for a while and then my my parents came and got me and then we moved back then we moved here the family moved here my fa- my father is uh, uh, my adopted father who's my dad mm-hmm. um, he um, uh, he's he uh, was a sheriff in San Bernardino County for a long time mm. yeah. <laughs> that's a rough area it is uh, he was a good cop though he's a really really good cop and uh, so uh, it's I and I got a lot of law enforcement in my family too, and they were like stationed out in Twenty Nine Palms and everything. So, mm. I, I just this was my home, and this is where I belonged. And um, my family decided to move back to Aust- the Austin area, like the Hill Country, because they wanted land, and mm-hmm. we wanted to open an animal sanctuary. So we did, and so we have a private animal sanctuary where we save livestock and dogs, lots of dogs. People have this. Um, Mistaken idea that if you just leave your dog out in the country, it reverts back to its feral state. But no, they don't. They usually get eaten by coyotes pretty quickly. Really? Oh, yeah. So my father, uh, I mean, at, uh, I think we, the most, we had 37 dogs at one time. Um, because, and most of them were, we just found on the road. And um, there's this one spot where people, it's a dumping so- site for people. And they just drive out, leave their pets and drive off. Are you serious? Yeah. So... My dad, who uh, he oh, fucked up. Yeah, it's really fucked up. So he gets out. Usually, he has like uh, two or three nights a week. He gets on his uh, little all-terrain golf cart because <laughs> mm-hmm. they've got huge, huge plot of land out there. And he goes to that spot, and uh, you know, drinking a drinking a beer, goes out, finds a dog, picks one up, calls my mom, says I got another one, and brings him home. And then they do all the stuff that you're supposed to do to make sure that the dog's healthy and that it's, 
it's not going to fight the other dogs or, you know, and all that. So, but we also have horses and livestock and donkeys and goats. Uh, we had chickens, but they didn't, they didn't last very long. Unfortunately, we have too many predators on the land. So I hear our uh, chickens have a really hard time with like coyotes are everywhere and they, and, yeah. and, and they're sneaky as fuck. Yeah. And I, and I never imagined like Texas having that much wildlife, but they do. They've got Bob, my parents on their land, they've got bobcats, beaver, deer, uh, uh, wild boar, which are, they are very territorial. They, yeah. And, uh, also, um, a lot of coyotes, a lot of coyotes and they're, you know, they're just looking for food. I mean, we moved into their area. That was their hunting ground for centuries. And so, you know, we bulldoze the land, we moved into their land. Yes. So we can't, we can't make, can't get mad at them. They're just doing what coyotes do. We just got to make sure we protect them. So we, I think, uh, and that's the thing, like, you know, um, you know, in, in, uh, in the, like the dairy industry stuff, cows are only allowed to live to be two, but we have, uh, we have cows and, um, bulls that are like 19, 20 years old. Yeah. And still, um, I went to visit my parents and uh, I was on that, that all-terrain golf cart and, uh, I was wearing a, I, I'm really allergic to, um, hay fever and, and pollen and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So, uh, my dad had, had just recently mowed the pasture. So I was, I was having like a lot of allergies. So I wore like a little mask over my face, surgical mask. Um, uh, I'm, uh, and, uh, uh, the bull saw me sitting next to my mom and he didn't recognize me. Gus, his name's Gus, big Gustus. And, uh, he started chasing us. And that, I've never seen a big thing move so fast in my life. And I was like, my mom's laughing. And I'm like, he's almost got, and he could have flipped us over. I mean, he's, he's strong, you know, he's super strong. And my mom's laughing and laughing and laughing. I'm like, ma, he's not, he's coming. I'm like turning around looking, videoing him. I'm like, ma, he's coming, he's close. And so she pulls in finally, and then she just gets out and she walks over to him and she's like, Gus, no. And my mom is like smaller than me, right? But, you know, they, they all listen to her. She's the alpha for sure. Yeah, so. I think animals could understand us with like what like the way like your like their frequency of your voice and 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 your tone. Oh sure, yeah. you know, and also language. I mean, they they learn. You know, they uh, they they learn. That's the wild part. Like you know, you think about uh, companion animals, typical like dogs, for example. In any mm -hmm. country, they learn the human language, whatever it is spoken. You know, they learn commands, they learn those things, and that's just weird. Like you know, we can't learn. We don't know dog <laughs> very well. I mean, yeah. certain things we can tell, but. Uh, um, that's one thing that makes, uh, you know, to me, animals so amazing. They can, they can understand our, our language and be trained, you know, by it. Yeah. And they understand other languages. That's why we, when you, yeah. it's, it's so funny when you hear someone else talking to like their cat or dog, like a different language than, than yours. Yeah. Because it's interesting, but, but that's, but the animal knows that yeah. language. That's right. It's, it's yeah. so, that's so bizarre. Yeah. I went to Germ. I, I dated this, I, I dated this, uh, this, uh, I had a, a German, um, a woman and she uh, we went to visit her her mom and they had they they had a bunch of like three or four dogs and they were all just yelling at them in german and i was like they had, it's just it was like with that culture shock moment yeah, of like, like hey wait a minute nine what what no yeah <laughs> yeah they, nine, nine they is know no, right that. yeah Man, you, you're screaming at your dogs in german it sounds so pissed it it is it's you know from uh, unfortunately World War Two has ruined uh, you know what how we perceive German <laughs> in, yeah. a, in a lot of ways. Uh, but she was from the Black Forest, so it, that's near France. France so okay. it's a little bit more f you know. And that that was another thing that was a culture shock too. Is I went to when I went to Germany, I realized that they have accents like mm -hmm. this, like in America, you know, like the South, they have a yeah. uh, Southern accents and New York, you know, and then all that stuff. And like the same thing happens in like we went to Berlin. And she was from, you know, the, closer to France. We went to Berlin, and they all knew that she, they called her a, in German. They were calling her a country girl because really? of her because of her accent. Her to me, accent. it sounded the same. I didn't recognize, you know, I sound like German, but to to them, to they, them, like those little yeah. subtleties are like, oh, yeah. that's like same thing in yeah. Rome. Like the Romans, like they, you know, they had. A, they, I went to Rome, and they, I had some friends there, and they. Uh, some guy from Venice came to visit. It was one of their friends, and he, they were like, "I ah, don't listen to this guy. He's Venetian, you know." You oh know. my goodness! What does he know? He's a country boy, you know. Because you know, Romans are very territorial about being and very proud of being Roman, you know. Yeah. So it's Rome. Yeah, it's Rome. It's I love Rome. Oh, I love Rome. It's so a beautiful much. place. Yeah. I've always wanted to see the uh, Colosseum, but never. Oh man! Never seen. Oh, it. you gotta go. 
it's one it's it's amazing because it, the outside you can actually still touch the you know it's still the the big the big columns that 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 are there that were built still. yeah two three thousand years ago it's amazing two three thousand year old building yeah and you can once you go inside they've recreated part of the floor where the gladiators used to fight and then you can go and you can walk through the seats of the coliseum and like and it's basically like a real coliseum and some of the senators had their own like seats and they, it's it's like chiseled in stone like senator so and so that was his box seat and it's ground floor right there and box seat to yeah. freaking death yeah dude <laughs> and they showed where they used to pop the animals out and Fuck. yeah you could actually see the catacombs underneath it's it's great you, you gotta go you gotta go imagine what entertainment was like back then bread and circuses man that's that's what they did they they would uh they'd get the port when when uh when the the peasants uh, the vox populi would would start to, uh, or the populi, I guess, would start to uh, to revolt against whatever they thought was going on. They were poor, they were hungry, uh, they held games, and so and they would throw bread out free, so people would go and then they would watch people fight to the death. Yeah, or you know, most of the time it was to the death. That's like the gladiator in, in real life. Yeah. They, oh, they, yeah. You see them. You see like those scenes that they're throwing bread out. To us, it's just a movie. But like, mm-hmm. wait, they they got that from somewhere. That's right. Yeah. That was that was real. That was what they did. That was how they would keep the Roman people appeased. It was called bread and circuses. Is what it was bread called. Bread and circuses. Yeah, that's what it was called. And circuses. It literally, people fighting to the death. Yeah, and they would the bring. Most they would. Way. They would go. To, they would go and get exotic animals that Romans hadn't seen before, and they, you know they would they would just slaughter them. You know they you know put lions in there and hippopotamus and you know whatever they would find they could they'd put in there and and nero used to fill it up and they'd have um uh he would fill the the coliseum up and they would have like miniature sea battles yeah oh my goodness yeah entertainment back then yeah man. <laughs> fuck that yeah yeah okay otep how how did you do this okay oh four four or five shows mm-hmm. no demo signed yeah, yeah. well um you know, we were just local band, just play, you know, putting in our dues. We probably rehearsed more than we played live shows, and because uh, and for me, rehearsals are, you know, we don't go in and like screw around. You know, that's not uh, how I want to do it. When I come in, I want to be, I want to train for the show so that when our if we play, we're not out of breath after the first song. Of course. So rehearsals are dress rehearsals. You know, I mean. If you're learning the song, that's something different. But once you know the song, once we know the set, and by that time, by, at that time, we had like five songs, maybe five songs. And so we were just trying to get them down and, and, and curate them and make sure that these are the right note choices and this is the right vocal choices, this is the right cadence, this is the right beat, that's the right you know, accent here or whatever. Um, after our first show, we opened for, and I can't remember the band's name, I'm sorry, but... Um, we played, and there was another. It was an A and R there to see the the headliner, and we mm. played, and so they got there early, and I I noticed them because there was only probably fifty people in the venue, and I noticed them, and it, they were on their BlackBerry, and I was like, okay, this is not this is not a you know a crowd member. Who is this guy? They have and, a cell phone. Yeah, Serious shit. right. <laughs> he was on a BlackBerry, right? Yeah. So then, and then uh, the next show we did. Uh, there was three guys on blackberries, and then <laughs> that's how you know when they have blackberries in their hand. That's right, yeah. And then they started talking to the 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 guy that was allegedly you know like our manager at the time, and and uh, you know just like okay, what are they got? Who are they? Just asking questions. So we started getting even more like we were getting like I was like this is serious, this is serious. Like I and he said you know. You know, Los Angeles is kind of jaded. The crowds are, and because you know, it's the everybody comes here to get mm-hmm. discovered. A little bit jaded, yeah. Yeah. So, we were one of the few bands at that time that was actually getting the crowd to move and to to do stuff as an opener, as a local band. And um, I remember we played um, the Roxy, and uh, we opened for Cold, a band called Cold. I don't know if they're still around or not. Uh, but uh, I went backstage and I sat down and it was a great show. We hit, I hit, I hit this like guttural that was so loud. It, like, it made the ceiling collapse and part of the ceiling collapsed when these little ceiling tiles at the Roxy came down. And uh, I went back into the dressing room and somebody comes in and they said, hey, Sharon wants to talk to you. And I was like, I don't know. You know, and it's one of those moments, right? After a show, I'm yeah. wiped. 
And I was like, I don't know any Sharon. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> I was like, I don't want to talk right now. You know, get her information. I'll talk later. You know, and they're like, no, Sharon Osborne. And I was like, I don't know a Sharon Osborne. And they're like, Ozzy Osborne. I didn't. I didn't. Dude, I had no idea. That's I had it. no idea. I had no idea anybody that, was paying attention to us badass. like that, you know? So like Sharon Osborne, Ozzy Osborne, you know that? And I was like, oh, yeah, hold on a second. So I start, you know, cleaning up and I go out there and she's like, oh, Tab, darling, you're playing Ozfest this year. And I said, great. Uh, and I looked at like the, the guy that was standing next to me he was, uh, with us, you know, like a, uh, and he, I was like, we're not signed. And, he, and she go, and she heard me, and he said, "She's like, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. You're doing it." So, uh, our first Ozfest, no, we had no demo, we had no record. We were just there. Eighth, and, eighth ninth show. Yeah, Ozfest. Uh, yeah, we were opening. Now, by that time, we had. Uh, by the time we actually did um, Ozfest, um, we played one more show, and we did um, the Viper Room. And um, the A and R for Capitol Records, his name is Ron Lafitte, was coming up the stairs, and he heard me, and he said, "I'm signing whoever that is." And so we were getting bidding wars from different labels, and and I was like nervous because I'm like, "We're we only have five. Like we told everybody we had eleven songs. We lied. I'm like, we only have five songs, y'all. Uh, and they're like, "Shh, I'm not saying anything. Be quiet. <laughs> 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 Stop it. You're gonna ruin it." So, uh, but, but by that time, um, we started talking to them and, and, um, when we hit, um, when we, our first Ozfest was in Illinois and we were second stage opening for Mudvayne right after LD50 had come out and Illinois is their home state. So we went from playing, I think the most we ever played at that point in Los Angeles on the Sunset Strip was maybe a hundred people, maybe. Maybe 100 people. Walk out, and there's 25,000 people in front of us waiting for Mudvayne. They don't, they're chanting Mudvayne. My guitar player at the time, because um, my original guitar player, had he had some personal stuff he had to take care of, so we got to fill in and to play with us for the festival. And um, So the way, was, that, was that his first show? Um, it was his second, second show. Oh. But he, he came to us with, like, I've played for this guy, and I know this guy, okay. and I know this guy. So, you know, he kind of brought this, like, resume. But as soon as we got there and we peeked around the corner and saw all those people, he, he got sick. And he would come out of the bathroom. And they're like, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, OTEP, five minutes. And I'm just like, dude, close your eyes. Pretend it's 50 people. We have to go on. And we go on. And, again, it's, it's, it's a similar experience to the HBO because it was, like, few laughs, few giggles, who's, you know, who's this little, because I was, I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't a, a power lifter then, I was, uh, I was a little, I was pretty chubby, so I walk out there, and I'm like, I had, you know, pigtails, and I had a, like a, um, this like head wrap on, and, and Dickie's pants, you know, the old school, you know, new, new metal stuff, and came out, and people were kind of giggling, and then as soon as we hit, we played, I think, Trick first, and as soon as I hit that first roar, that's the pit just went Dang. and it was on after that i mean it was on and then you know uh so it was it wasn't so much anything that i did other than just playing music and taking it serious and you know making sure that every show counted because that's what i wanted i never expected to get signed i never i didn't know anything about music didn't know anything about the music industry i just wanted to make music i just wanted to play music and it just happened so fast and i had to learn really quickly the ins and outs, the good and bad. That's very quick. I'm, I'm not sure if people are really aware how quickly you had to adjust. Yeah, yeah, and and also I was, you know, I was the only female on the whole tour uh, uh, during, as far as like a player. I mean, there was like people behind the scenes. Sharon mm -hmm. was running stuff, um, but I was the only female front person, and that was like also um, a big weight to carry. You know, a lot of people. I got asked like oh, I don't know a million times. So what's it like being a woman in a metal band? And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, uh, what's it like being a woman in anything? You know, <laughs> or, or being a minority in anything? Like ask somebody, it's the same answer. Um, it was tough. So, um, but at the same time, it it um, it it allowed being on Ozfest allowed me to learn really quickly. Like I, I studied other bands. I studied what they did. Um, I remember the first time we toured with uh, Slipknot and, you know, there's nine of them and I brought my guys and we're a four piece. And I said, you see what all nine of those guys are doing? 
we can never be that, but we're going to do it as, as our best job to be as close to that as possible. I mean, look at what they're doing up there. And uh, yeah, what was your main lesson? Because you're when you're, when you're trying to learn from di- di- different bands, what, what are like a couple of takeaways? Uh, not to insult the audience, uh, you know, that was a big one because there, there were a lot of bands who were like, What the fuck is wrong with you guys? Why aren't you hyped up? And instead, you know, it's to tell them how amazing they are, and you know, uh, but also, um, the bands that I saw when they were on stage, it was. It was their moment. They occupied that moment. They owned that stage. It was theirs. And um, they played as a unit instead of just being like a guitar player or a singer or a bass player, drummer. They played as a unit. And that's that's what I learned. I mean, we were trying to do that anyway, but it just sort of, you know, you can only tell people something so many times before they actually see it themselves. And then you can go, see, Mm -hmm. that's what we got to try to do, guys. And so I, I think I learned uh, about that, and also I just learned a lot about live performance because I hadn't had much experience in that. So um, that was that was a big one for me too. Watching a bunch of like, you know, people that I admired up there just murdering it, and I murdering wanted to do, it. I wanted to do the same thing, yeah. Especially with the era you're talking, 2000, 2001, like the era of bands going just ape shit. Yeah, yeah. Two thousand one, two thousand two was. We only played um, uh, about. I think we only played maybe three weeks of the first tour uh, because we had to get back and start writing our first record. Mm -hmm. Uh, When we played 2002 OzFest, it was insane. It was insane. We had people chanting our name, and we were in the rotation, so we would start at 9 o'clock in the morning, you know, and then we'd wait. You know, we'd cut our songs go because they'd open the doors and we'd already set up and waiting, and we're just seeing people running across the field to get to the stage. Um, But um, it caused a little bit of a problem with some of the bands because they were chanting our name all day long in between so in between bands and stuff so some of the bands got a little got caught up in their feelings ah uh, band beef yeah and i was i i was like uh, i don't know what do you want me to do and actually a manager from a, a band i won't say who it is but a band reached out to my manager and said you got to tell her to tone it down no yeah she's making everybody look bad and I'm just like, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing. That. He's like, well, but you know, you got it's, this. Is a, this is an industry of relationships. And I said, but I, I don't want that kind of relationship. I'm gonna if they want to if they want to do something, then up their game. Don't ask me to turn mine down. That's ridiculous. Why would I do that? It's like the one thing you're not supposed to do. Yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> I hurt my one fe- thing. I, don't don't do that. Like that. I was like that was hurt my feelings a little bit. You know, I was like, you're asking me to turn it down because they can't step it up or they don't want to. So yeah. That that's so fucked up. Yeah, it was, like, and, but, and we we want to see the bands be like as crazy as fucking possible. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you you fucking you were insane. Oh, I, that's I, I watched like the old videos. And I'm like, damn, what the? <laughs> Just the era, and then like you're talking. So, so you only so you play a few in two, 2001. The first record's not out yet, and then October of that year, mm-hmm. uh, you go in with. With uh, with Terry Date for like six weeks uh, uh, up in Seattle, right? Yeah. How did you guys get hooked up with Terry Date? Uh, he, uh, I, I think the label had reached. Out to, uh, I think the label reached out to him and said, "Hey, you know, here's, here's a, here's. I don't, I don't know how he heard our music or or what, but he did, and um, he was interested in working with us. So he's like, he came down to L.A. watched a rehearsal to kind of really give it like a. Uh, a thumbs up or thumbs down, really. And Dang, so he came down. So, oh, yeah, God. man. And he walked in. And, and Terry Date was like the, I mean, he's still amazing, but he, he was, was the guy. he was the guy. Him and Ross Robinson, like they were the guys back then, you know. And um, we, um, we went up to Seattle and that was also life-changing for me in a lot of ways because one, I'm a huge Hendrix fan, huge Nirvana fan. So I'm in Seattle. Uh, we're, we're recording in the studio that's owned by Pearl Jam's drummer. The Deftones had just recorded in there. And so, yeah, and I'm a huge Chino fan. So I was like, and Stefan fan, like I just, you know, I love, I love all of it. But I was like, uh, um, I asked Terry, I said, can you set me up the same way that Chino does his vocals? And he's like, sure. Great question. Yeah, so, <laughs> cause I wanted to feel that. So he put up, he gave me a, there was a sofa and a rug and he. A sofa? Yeah. Uh, I guess she, it, 
at least what Terry said. I mean, I can't. I all I know is what Terry said. But uh, Chino was was um, recording, uh, sitting down vocals. Uh, he, I think he moved around. It, there was an upstairs area, so he moved on the he moved on the stairs. He went. He would he would sing inside the inside like they put a baffle up, and then he would just sit there and he had like a little port wine. And so he would, like, drink it, and there was a trash can, so he would, like, gargle with it between takes and spit it out. And so I never had... Wait, port- wine? Port wine. What the, what the hell is that? It's like a dessert wine. It's really thick and really strong. It's almost... It's, it's good, but it's, like... It's almost, like, uh, it's strong, and it's, uh, it's like a liqueur, almost. And so I would, uh, I would do that, but, man, it was, uh, it was almost... At first, I, it felt like... Drinking Robitussin or cough medicine or something. So, like are that. you drinking it or are you? Uh, just it out? gargling, just gargling with it, just to, yeah. Gargling port and wine, spitting it in the trash can, yeah, between takes. So, if you're at, so this is October two thousand one. They just recorded White Pony then. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. That's some good energy right there. Oh man, it felt great. It was so amazing to be in there. It really was. And then we, then you know, we we did, and there was just so much history in that room and. And uh, it was a lot of fun because we actually could st- we we lived up in Seattle. We had we had um, like um, what do you call it? Uh, they had given us the label got got us like these little corporate apartments, and we just traveled to the studio every day. We spent twelve hours a day, six days a week in there, and we went from we could screw you know we could also write more while we were in there. So if we wanted to develop the songs a little bit, we had that opportunity before we got down to recording. And this is when Pro Tools was still. You know, was still like in its Infant. infancy, yeah. And so everything was recorded to tape, and so that's why you know a lot of people Same listen. Lot. Yeah, and I did that for a long time. I still would record to tape, and then they would digitize it because yeah. there's just a warmth to it that you just can't get from digital. Mm-hmm. Um, they've come close now with like plugins and things, but um, I did that up until I think whew, um, maybe the seventh album, and. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we recorded there and I was in a really, you know, it, it was a, October in Seattle is like a permanent ceiling of cloud. There's no sun. No sun. And, uh, so that really helped, I think, with the, the character of the album, the overall attitude mm-hmm. and feeling, cause I was already in kind of a dark place, you know, um, this was me for the first time opening up my private journals, my private poetry, things that I only wrote for myself, songs that I only, you know, things that I only wrote for me. And then here I am like, everyone's going to hear this. The producer's going to hear it. And uh, like songs like Jonestown Tea, um, which that deals with... fucked. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And uh, again, a, a little autobiographical. And also, uh, we used to play that song live. And um, I would improv a lot. And so the song, I think, it itself is about 11 minutes, nine, nine minutes, 11 minutes on the album. And then live, we'd play it. Sometimes we'd go like 15, 15 to 16 minutes long. So. Yeah, did you already have that song? So you probably already had it written, obviously. But then there, there, you mentioned a point where like you actually were jamming it in front of people. And then you decided to improv. And then actually what that's what actually became the song. Wait, we should probably do something with this. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of how it happened, and and the band was a little bit. They didn't really. They were nervous about it because they're like, "Wow, this is," you know. They were hugging me after every every time we finish this. What they the song. do when they first heard that? Um, they were very uncomfortable, and they were very. Uh, they didn't know what I was doing, so and they also Sick. didn't know like what. Yeah, they they had no clue, and Sick. and <laughs> yeah, man, it was. Because I went, I, I went, you know, to some really dark places with that, and um, the when I recorded it with Terry, I asked him. I said, "So, because um, when when I first sat down with the band, and they were like, so how, musically, how do you want us to approach this song? You know, we know what it's about. We've heard it. You know, like what you're saying, and I I love the Doors, and so um, uh, I said, listen to the end by the Doors." And that's, mm. that's where we'll start. And um, if you've ever seen Apocalypse Now, that's like, uh, that's like the first song that, that is played as they're, as they're dropping Agent Orange all over the, mm-hmm. the canopy there in Cambodia. But um, I just told him to approach it from that, you know, because um, I can still listen to The End by the Doors and those first notes that Robbie Krieger plays on guitar is just so, 
uh, they, they're, they're transformational. I, I, I find myself losing myself and I've been listening to that song since I was a kid, you know? Mm. So that's how we approached it. And then when I recorded it with Terry, they said, Hey, he just left, he lit a candle and he put me in the, um, in the control booth and he left and he said, just do your thing. And I did. And then after I was done, uh, they came in, everybody came in and I left and, and they sat there. And when I, I, I after it was over, I, walked back in and they were, they were all looking down and they just all hugged me and said, we're proud of you. And they walked out. So that was cool. So they were probably in the control room listening to you just kind of freak out. Uh, yeah. And just, and tell a story, you know, I mean, yeah. tell it, tell a really dark, dark story. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, the, the songs that what I like to do, I mean, even songs like my confession, which we still play live today. Um, the 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 idea is that uh, I I I used to read a lot of Jean Paul Sartre and the ex- existentialists believe you know you you embrace the void you mm-hmm. see that there's there's hideousness in this existence but you don't turn away from it you try mm-hmm. to bring beauty to it you try to bring awareness to it you try to fill that void mm-hmm. and so um, that's the approach that I had so when you get to these really really dark songs that I write about my confession which is you know, it's it's a lot about um, someone who's um, con- contemplating suicide, contemplating you know their place in the world. If mm-hmm. you know, if if oblivion is better than mm-hmm. existing, and but then it turns around at the end of the song, and like you know, because throughout the song I'm saying there's no way out, there's no way out, there's no way out. Then the outro is, you've got to push your way out. And that's where it gets all hyped. And that's where if you've, you've been to the show, so you see me get everybody jumping and jumping and jumping. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's when it goes into the outro. And the same thing happens with Jonestown T. It's about this. It's a very, very long, dark song. But the end turns around and is, is really positive. Like, you know, I'm not going to let what happened to me guide my life anymore. And you, ha- you don't have that power over me anymore. Whatever, you know, the victimizer doesn't have the power over me. I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what the song was meant to be. It's a great like mental switch because like your brain automatically wants to go to like the victim mode, but you kind of switch it over. Hey, wait, actually, no, I'm not. Mm. And and if you talk to a lot of people who have who have had similar situations, you know, most of them do identify as being a survivor, not as a victim. They mm-hmm. have survived this, and that's what I I try to uh, support that because they are they're survivors, man. You must have really trusted Terry. I did. I still do. Yeah. I still talk to him every now and then. He's awesome. That's great. But that's one of the, you know, as you know, as a recording artist, I mean, that's one of the things that you want most is you want to be in a room with somebody that you can trust that's going to give you positive and honest feedback and is going to also be maybe a guide for you a little bit, mm-hmm. especially for someone like me who gets lost in myself a lot and lost in my emotions, lost in my writing. I want someone that's kind of, you know, a beacon in that darkness. It's like going to always bring me back and, and maybe offer, you know, a good solution or a good idea or a good path. Uh, and sometimes, you know, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's, it's the opposite. Sometimes it's like, eh, it's all right. You know, yeah. I'll try another song, but not this one. Um, but that's the, I always want to be around people that I can be vulnerable with. And um, that way I can open up and, and, and give, the fans and the audience and, and, and people who listen, supporters and so forth, um, as I can be as honest as I, I can be, you know, and I think they deserve that. How many songs did you have prepared before you went up to Seattle? Uh, let's see. We had 10. 10. So, you, yeah. so, so it wasn't five. You were, you're no, like, no, we ended up writing a whole okay, lot more good, once okay. once we knew that we were assigned to Capitol Records. <laughs> you, and you didn't tell Terry Dave, oh, we have five. But no, <laughs> no, no. And, and in fact, when he came in, we're like, you know, we don't want to waste your time. We're just going to play you the, the our eight best. And he was fine with that. Oh, cool. So, but uh, yeah, we ended up um, writing. Uh, or we had we had some general ideas uh, before we went to Seattle, but then we were able to flesh them out more once we got in the studio up there hmm. with him. Yeah, what was like the writing process like? Um. But when, when we're so maybe let's say for like blood pigs, you know how how did that song really come about? So I I I'd, I'd been writing I'd, I'd read Lord of the Flies again I, I like that book a lot um, and uh, I know nerd uh, nerd alert Otep likes books um, but but uh, I Lord went of to Flies. 
Lord of the Flies, man, yeah. And uh, and that's what the pig head stands for because I get a lot of I get a lot of uh, sometimes a lot of hate mongering from uh, vegans who are like, you're vegan, why do you have a pig head on stage? I'm like, well, first of all, it's fake, and second of all, it's an homage, it's a literary homage to the Lord of the Flies, because in the Lord of the Flies, if people aren't familiar with it, it basically, a plane goes down, all the adults die, the children are left on this island, mm -hmm. and yeah. That's it, right? Y yeah, and so okay. uh, one group is kind of becomes feral, and they decide that, you know, they're, they should be in charge, um, and that in, in order to keep the peace, they tell everybody there's a beast living in the jungle and they're the only ones that can protect them, basically. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just butchering the story, but basically that's it. And so there's one kid that gets picked on a lot and um, it, it, they call him Piggy because he's a little chubby little kid. And um, he says, maybe there is no beast. Maybe there's only us. And that's what happens. Like, they end up killing Piggy. I'm sorry. Spoiler alert. They end up killing Piggy, and they're about to kill this other kid when suddenly a plane lands to rescue him. And it's all these. It's like, you know, the Royal Air Force or something because it's, it's. I think it's written by a British author. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you know, all that stuff that they had done, all this murder and all this savagery and everything they had done in this sh short amount of time. Now they've got to go back and be prep school boys and explain why they did that. And so uh, the idea is that, you know, there is evil in the world, but it, it, it exists in the human heart, you know. So that's mm -hmm. what Blood Pigs was about. It started writing about that. Then it, you know, as a lot of songs do, they, they start to venture out and branch out into other meanings and things. Mm -hmm. But that's where it started. And I remember uh, just kind of reading the lyrics. We were sitting around in, in um, a writing room, and we were just I was kind of reading the lyrics to everybody. And then I think the guitar player at the time kind of came up with a riff, and the bass player joined in, and the drummer joined in. And then mm -hmm. I started, I go, oh, I got it, I got it, keep going, keep going. Just play that circular, circular, circular. And so they kept just playing the riff over and over and over again. And then finally, at the the things that I had written started to fall into place. And then I was like, okay, I think I got it. And then I grabbed the mic and then the rest was history, you know. That's That song, uh, I, I, I'm, I'll be not professional for about 10 seconds. I listen to that song a lot. Oh, thank you. A lot. Uh, I appreciate that. A thank lot. You. And uh, it's just, uh, I recently discovered this I love to do last month. When you go to a restaurant alone mm. and it's eat a dinner, I was having a, a beer and when you listen to music in your headphones alone, just reading the lyrics, it's so cool. Yeah, you're like you're like out, but you're in like your own world. Yeah, yeah. And you're just you're just loose. You're having you're having your your dinner. And that was just something I've done a lot of times with 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 your music, Otep. And Thank then you. I was just I was like her one. What is she talking about? But I know. But I know. To me, music travels in frequency. Mm. So that, but I, that the words are just hit you in a way. It's like, what is, man, what, what trauma is she <laughs> channeling? Because you're, because yeah, you're man. also like a, the vocal range that you hit during that song. I mean, has resonated for twenty plus years. Yeah. The way, like, I just haven't heard someone do it that way. Where like it'll start like you're saying something then it's, it's like this demonic scream mm -hmm. and then it goes like doesn't stop it goes back down mm -hmm. and then like the like the, the very famous obviously like low like roar I'm like what yeah. the I was like how do what the <laughs> fuck how, how did you like that's just it just yeah it just kind of transcends words thank you it, it's cool yeah. it's you know when when um, when I was first discovering to do all that of course I had listened to a lot of a lot of different inspirations for it and but when I when I went in to do that song I mean it, again it was about just unzipping I could be vulnerable with Terry I could mm -hmm. be I could be who I wanted to be and he just said go for it you know rolling you know press the button and so I did and so those moments where you hear me you know you know going up in in to the that that high banshee scream I call it and then I go back down you know that's just all breath control it's all just maintaining that control and that pain and and that anger and and that anguish and and also I think the determination to overcome it it's there that 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 power and so you just you just kind of lock in and 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 it's hard for me to to describe because it's so um, instinctual for me to do it, 
you know. And like I remember the first time it was my first Ozfest, my first full Ozfest. I'd uh, Phil and Selma walked up to me, and um, uh, you know he's Phil, right? So he comes over, <laughs> yeah. and he's got his arms crossed, and he's got this goatee, and he's like, "You're Otep, right?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm Otep, man. How you doing, Phil?" He's like, "What kind of vocal processor do you use on stage?" And I said, "I don't." I use a Beta 58A, man. And he said, no, you don't. What kind of vocal processor do you use? And I said, I'm about to play. Come, come watch. And so he came, he watched from side stage. And uh, really nice of him because he kind of stayed out of the way so nobody would be like, look, it's Phil. You know? mm -hmm. And um, uh, after the show was over, he goes, okay, fine. You don't use a vocal processor. <laughs> <laughs> And later wow. I just saw him, he was like, he took a nap in the middle of the street, right? Like right where the buses were driving and no, everybody just, nobody bothered him. I mean, it was different feel back then, you know, of course, you know, but uh, it was, it was an amazing moment because, you know, I know that, you know, he's got, uh, he's got such a powerful voice, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, for to have him come up and do his whole, you know. Yeah. What kind of vocal processor do you use? And I've I've met Phil several. We recorded at one of his, I think he owns part of a studio in, in New Orleans, and we recorded a record right after Hurricane Katrina down there. And he came, and uh, he was he was just wild, man. I I uh, I had to go in and calm him down because we were trying to record in the other room because he, oh, yeah. he was just so loud in there. I was like, Phil, Ota, I'm like, dude, shh. shh. Sorry, sorry. Oh, trying to work. Trying to work here, man. You know, we're paying by the hour. <laughs> yeah, because when when you're like a just a, a just a casual listener, and you're finding out like this new band for the first time, you're like, you hear it, you're like, what? What is that? Hmm. Is that is that possible? Like, what? It, what the heck? Yeah. Yeah. And um, it, it was yeah. it was it was the thing is is too is like a lot of people thought that. Uh, who had just heard the record, like say Blood Pigs, who just heard Blood Pigs, mm -hmm. um, they would be like, oh, "Who's that guy screaming?" Mm -hmm. You know, and then I'd be like, "Oh, that's me," and they're like, "No, it's not," and I was like, "No, it's me, that's me," and I'm like, "Come to the show, come see you, see what I do," you know, um, and even now people will accuse me of like using like this and that and that, and then I'm like. Okay, go to my Instagram and look at the second video I just posted recently mm -hmm. of like just from this last tour of me doing Blood Pigs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, it's just me and a, I had a, I actually got a, uh, I had a wireless now because I, 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 I was getting tripped up by the wired mics. But yeah, I, I uh, you can hear it. It's live, man. And it's, it's there. I mean, it's deep and heavy and powerful and, and, uh, uh, I I understand why certain people th would think that because they don't mm -hmm. they typically don't see a lot of women and now it's changing gratefully thankfully uh, mm -hmm. that women are doing a lot more vocals uh, and and doing heavy vocals um, but when I started it was not very many people were doing what I was doing and so not many people believed that I could do it and so uh, and then once I got into voiceover and I was doing like movies and you know video games and things and and uh, people quickly we were like okay all right we hear that you know we hear the monsters and everything that you can do so I what, don't a, what, what a compliment though I, yeah it's probably it probably at first when you hear it and you see it, you're talking to them it's probably a, a, that first initial massive diss but it's actually but yeah. the undertones are actually a major compliment oh, actually that's me yeah yeah it, 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 at first still, it was always like hey no 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 and and, and I, I mean at first i i kind of i felt yeah you're right i felt kind of good about going correcting them like no yeah. that's me that's me. That's that's all me, man. Can't that's fake me. that shit. Can't fake it. It's no. real. And if you want to see, I'll be on stage in like an hour, so you can come watch. But so, well, you come watch. I'm yeah, there. I'm right there, dude. <laughs> and you know, it's uh, but you know, the the one that that bothered me the most is when like when we used to do like signings at Fye tents, you know, back in the day mm. at Ozfest, and people would come in and say things like, uh, "Oh, you scream pretty good for a girl." Oh no. And I would just look at him. I go. I don't just scream good, like, for anybody. And uh, 
They would just be like, no, I, I, I just mean that you just, you, it's, it's, I've never heard a girl scream like that. And I'm like, oh, that's, mm-hmm. that's the way to say it. That's a better yeah. way to say it. Otherwise it sounds mm-hmm. a little insulting. Obviously there's parts of that, but there's also some, some of like, some, sometimes people just will like be around you and they're so nervous. They'll, they'll say something. They say, okay, I, I have to say something. Oh, I'll, I'll say this. And yeah. then it's just, it comes out like, oh, is that what yeah. I that's to say? <laughs> I know. I didn't want to say that. That's true. I, it's happened to me. I met, when I met Dave Grohl once, I was like. I can't because you know, my bus driver went to like school with him or something. So they, he was at the uh, he was uh, on the Sunset Strip and and uh, I got to meet him and I just looked at him and I just scruffed his beard, his little his little beard. I was like, "You're Dave Grohl. I can't talk to you." And I ran away because <laughs> I was like, "You're you're in two of my favorite bands. I can't I can't talk to you, man." And he was like, "Oh, you're that girl that goes grrr." And I was like, "Yeah, that's me. Awesome." Oh my and, I loved, and I ran away. Yeah. 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 When someone gives you a, ma- a major compliment, you're like, I think that that that's your go-to harness from run away. The exit. 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 Yeah. I like, must. Yeah. I must exit this beautiful moment as soon as possible. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Use. I don't want to ruin it. I don't want to say something that else that I'm going to walk away with what you just said and keep that like right here. And I have all these years. It was pretty amazing. Hmm. You've been. I mean, you're talking like the first record comes out. So you're at Ozfest 2001 and 2002. Like you were. Oh, Tip, you were really like a pioneer in like extreme vocals for for women. Mm-hmm. Like a really like this one of those early. Okay, wait, she could do like anything. <laughs> Holy, well now it's, it's it's pretty common. You know, you have you have yeah. a, a bunch of sick sick bands. You have to think about like Arch Enemy and stuff. It's mm-hmm. like, but back then you did this. It was like what a handful of bands. Uh, yeah, I mean when I, I and and I was so new to the genre, I didn't know a whole lot. So I, as mm-hmm. far as I knew, there weren't very many at all. And even even audience attendance, it was mostly male. And if they brought their girlfriend or their mm-hmm. sister, or, you know, a friend or something. And now mm-hmm. it's like the first five rows are all women and getting murdered by the pit, you know, behind them, you know, because they're getting smashed against the barricades. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's uh, there's there's I I think there's some I have uh, mixed feelings about it in, in a lot of ways because yeah, I I did go out there and I did put myself on the line for a lot of for. Um, for myself, I mean, I, when people ask me questions like, what's it like being a girl in this and all that, I never thought about it. I didn't think about gender. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about any of that. I just thought I was a singer in a band and I was doing what I do and people are either going to like it or they're not. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. think I'm a woman and I'm doing something that women don't do. I just never thought of it like that. It wasn't until people started asking me like, what's it like to be compared, you know, to Corey Taylor and Phil Anselmo and, and Chino Moreno? And I was like, pretty awesome pretty awesome as the female version i'm like oh well okay yeah that's still awesome but you know um and now that there's so many um artists that are coming up um you know i i I, i'm i'm glad to see that i'm glad to see that if i had anything to do with inspiring them or opening any doors or you know uh building digging any moats <laughs> mm-hmm. not just drawing a line but digging a moat uh then i'm i'm proud of that because uh you know we all benefit from when uh music is 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 represented by a, a diversity we all benefit from it you know mm-hmm. so you've always seen to put your neck out there with, yeah. with pretty much with pretty much anything yeah like that, that i mean that era i mean i'll never I always explain it the best i can like there's different eras like my era is like you know 2005, but 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 we, but we missed that crazy. We'll never understand or know what that was like for so for you to come out and be a a pioneer and then go off to even come out and do other things to so always put your neck out there first. Mm-hmm. You know, it seems, seems like always you always been like like a natural leader. Uh, I I I guess so. I think uh, I I I look at things like um. If I'm in a position where I can say something, I will. And mm-hmm. um, I grew up really poor and in and not great environments. So, mm-hmm. you know, if the, no one was saying anything or stepping up to do something, then I would. And um, that's just how I was like that when I was a kid. And I'm, I'm like that now. I feel like if no one's speaking up, why not? You know, and so, uh, so somebody should, should speak for for these people that uh, for and people like me, my my people, whoever they are, um, we should. And I don't know, you know. It's it, I thank you for saying that. A, a natural leader uh, usually translate in uh, in certain circles as being a bitch. You know, women 
When you're when you take on leadership roles, you're like a bitch or something like that. But mm-hmm. men can be bossy and you know rude and or leaders, and they're mm-hmm. they're seen as that. So mm-hmm. um, hopefully that's changing. I mean, you said it, so it must be changing. But uh, thank you for saying that. That's very kind of you. Thank yeah, you. and uh, I mean, even like uh, your band's just coming out, and like you have, you know, people that book festivals trying to ba- blacklist you for just yeah. you speak like speaking your mind, and uh, that's why. It, there's only like a few guests that I, I've had that like I, I could kind of see like there's no filter. And I, that's mm. th- th- those are the guests I want. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool. I just mean, <laughs> just well, fucking speak. I'm right here, brother. You know, it's no like, filter. It's like just you know, just speak your mind because people like bands, bands are just afraid or artists are afraid just like to lose what they have. So yes. they, so they won't take that next step. Yes. And when you come out. And say what what you want to say, and then you there's rumors going around that like oh we're going to get blacklisted from this fucking festival, or this mm-hmm. agent doesn't want to work with us, or like and but but you never you, also what you have is you never backtracked. No, that's sick. Never. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, first of all, thank you. That's very kind of you. Uh, second. When I was really vocal about a lot of things, like uh, when I wrote Warhead, and mm-hmm. that you know I I have military family. I mean, mm-hmm. most of my, uh, the men in my family have uh, served in the United States military, mm-hmm. um, especially the older generation. Um, so when I wrote Warhead, uh, it wasn't, people were blank saying I was against the troops because I disagreed with the president, which mm-hmm. was Bush at the time. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm, I, why are we going into Iraq? You know, they they didn't attack us. Mm-hmm. So, um, I had no problem with us trying to hunt down bin Laden in Afghanistan and anywhere that he was hiding, but he wasn't hiding in Iraq. So we didn't have, you know, and I, I have mm. the ultimate respect for all our military personnel who go where they're supposed to go and do their jobs and just want to get home to their families. And they want to help, you know, defend the United States of America. I had, um, and I have a lot of veterans, I had a lot of active duty pe- um, personnel still come to my shows and they've given me their medals. They've given me... Um, uh, different things that they've earned. Uh, I had one um, young woman from the United States Marine Corps who was on, um, she was on leave from Afghanistan and uh, some guy was groping women in the audience and she saw it and he, then he, she, she said something to him and then he groped her and then she proceeded what to just fuck? Marine the shit out of this fool. Like she just beat him down so bad. His nose looked like a deflated balloon. It was laying on the side of his face. After the show was over, I shook her hand and I gave her some signed stuff she wanted signed. And then she gave me the hat that she wore in Afghanistan and I still have it. It smells like sweat and sand. And, um, beautiful. Yeah. And I just feel like, you know, I had a lot of, when I was speaking out, I had a lot of like, um, um, bands that are much bigger than me, but I'm friends with their, with the singers or the guitar players or whatever. And they would text me like, that's amazing. Thanks for saying what you're saying. You know, my brother's in the military or my cousin's in the military or thank you for doing that. And I'm thinking, why aren't you doing it? And I would ask them, why aren't you doing it? You have a yeah. much bigger audience than me. You have yeah. much bigger reach than I do. They said, well, we don't want to divide our audience and we don't want to mm. lose, you know, what we have. You know, we know that you're getting shadow banned. We know you're getting blacklisted from festivals. I mean, honestly, the last traveling festival I did was Ozfest. Really? And that's it. Yeah. Now I didn't even I think about that. I, oh, wow. I tried to get on Mayhem. I didn't realize that. I didn't. I tried to get on Mayhem every year. And they never accept. They didn't even give me a shitty offer. Five hundred bucks, fifty bucks, nothing. They didn't give me a shitty offer. They just didn't want me. I played Knotfest mm. one year, and the guy that that ran Knotfest also ran um, Mayhem, and he came over to me and and said, th- and and he was like, did not want me to play that festival, and so we were supposed to play second stage, and they put us on the local stage, even though our dressing room was way across the way. Uh, at second stage, so hmm. uh, we. But I was like, I don't care. Fuck it, let's play. Let's play. But wherever they put us, we put us in a parking lot. So um, about five minutes before we're supposed to go on, I had my guitar player start playing through the speakers. Just I said, just you know, we call it Jun Juns. I said, just Jun 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 Jun. And all of a sudden, we were peeking out, and we just saw people running, sprinting across the fields to get to us. And uh, by the time it was over, I mean, I got video of that too. I, I, I try to get as much evidence as possible to be like, listen, you know, I don't know why you're doing this because I cut my teeth on festivals. I mean, I like I said, like you brought up earlier, I only did 
you know, five, six, seven shows before OzFest was my seventh or eighth show as a live band. And I mm-hmm. cut my teeth on festivals. I learned how to play festivals. That's how I learned how to, con- you know, audience control and, and band control and just what I do live, I learned on festivals. Mm-hmm. We had 20 minutes to play on OzFest. So you had to cram everything into 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And so um, when the other traveling festivals were going on, and we actually won a poll one year by the fans, who do you want to see on Mayhem? And the OTEP won, and they didn't even offer. I reached out to my agent. I'm like, did we get an offer? No. And so um, after it was over, they're like, oh, well, we'll talk about it. And even um, Slipknot manager came up to me and said, hey, sorry, we had you on the wrong stage. It was a mistake. And I was like, oh, it don't matter. It's cool, man. Don't sure. worry about it. I'm going to do whatever I have to do. And that's why, you know, sometimes, like, haters will come on and they'll be like, all you ever do is headline. Well, there's a, there's a reason why, because um, we don't get offers from other bands because I think they're nervous that we're going to, I'm going to come out and either, you know, well, outplay them and they're going to have to tell me to tone it down again because that not only happened on OzFest, it happened on some other shows that I've done with other people. But it's either that or they just don't, they don't like me. You know, they don't like what I say or what I stand mm-hmm. for, and I don't care. I'm I've been doing this for two decades. My ninth album. I've uh, I'm just gonna keep doing what I do, and if they don't like it, they don't have to. You know, Mayhem's not around anymore, but I am. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think I think people should be allowed to be out of control. That's just that's that's, just, that's what I mean. That's music. what I thought. You know, I mean, I was I was there when. People, uh, when on certain festivals that I, I played on, um, different shows where there were other artists who were on main stage where were, you know, urinating in cups and throwing them on the crowd or throwing them on security, doing shit like that. And I'm thinking like, like nothing. yeah, and they're not even getting in trouble for it. Okay, yeah, they've, out, they've sold a lot more records than I have, but that gives them more leeway. Okay, how about you give me that same opportunity and see what happens? But... It just didn't play out that way for me, and I've accepted it, and, and I'm I'm just doing what I do, man. I just I'm just doing it, you know. And it's 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 weird because I do have a lot of friends in some really big bands, and I've actually like reached out to them, like, hey, you know, y- you played on one of my records, well, you know. I heard you guys are getting getting back together, and you're going out. What about taking me, man? You know, you can come out and play one of the songs you helped me write. And nope, not even a not even a reply. So I've just accepted it. This is, this is my existence. This is my reality. And I'm just going to keep doing what I do, you know. Why do you, th- Ote, why, why do you think that is? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Because I know that there, was, there are other political bands that are much more political than I am. Fever 333, they're extremely mm-hmm. political. Great band. I like them a lot. Um, but they're, they're, I think as far as politically, they're probably far left than I am. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know that like that was a big excuse. Oh, she's too liberal or, mm-hmm. you know, she's too, um, you know, she's going to talk. She's going to give a political speech on stage or something like that. And I never mm-hmm. I don't do that. You know, I, I, I play music. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't. It's a it's a conundrum. And I stopped trying to figure it out a few years ago because it just kept breaking my heart, really, because I really wanted to be out there and I really wanted to play. And I'm like, I sell tickets, I sell merch, I kick ass on stage, my band kicks ass on stage, it's not just me. We do our jobs. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have any problems with us. You're not, you know, no one's going to have any problem. We're just going to go up there and, and rock the house and give everybody a, you know, a memory. And that's what I thought you know, these, these things are for. But some people just have it in their minds that they just don't like me. So I don't know. That's it's weird. weird. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, boy, it's, it's very weird. Yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of what you want in an in industry. You want someone that's kind of, uh, she, you know, she might be a little bit political. Who cares? You want you, you you want that kind of energy on a tour package. That and and the social issues too. You know, I think I think there was a time early on in my career when people didn't know that I was I was a lesbian, and mm-hmm. so they thought. You know, a lot of the people thought, "Oh, she'll come." You know, I had a I had a radio guy once. Radio, he's a, a programmer for a radio station Mm -hmm. and uh he asked me he's like hey me and my girlfriend we're going back to the house we're gonna party you know we're gonna cut up some lines we're gonna gonna drink and we're gonna sit in the hot tub you want to come 
And first of all, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe, so sitting in like a hot tub of strangers, it's like a petri dish. I'm not really interested in that. First of all, <laughs> I don't know what you've been doing in that hot tub, and I don't know, mm -hmm. you know. And also, I just I've got a show tomorrow. I can't go out and like hang out with you, and I don't do drugs like that. And respect to people that do their own thing. It's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I just I've got to sing tomorrow, so I can't be up all night, and I I don't and I you know you want to sit around and go get a coffee and talk about, you know, Hunter S. Thompson or, you know, mm. a, a, a favorite writer of mine or something like that. We can do that. We can, we can hang out. But if we're, I don't, I, I just have no interest in going hanging out with you and like your stripper girlfriend and no disrespect to that either. Like, you know, everybody's got their own thing, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's like, it wasn't, so those things just started to build up over time, I think. Mm -hmm. And people started to get this without ever even talking to me or my, or my representatives, like what's she like? You know, what is she like? You know, is she mm -hmm. going to give us trouble? Is there going to be problems? But what trouble? Like, we don't destroy hotel rooms. We don't we don't destroy green rooms. We don't do any of that shit. Like, we just play music. That's all we do. Mm -hmm. And for those that don't like the music, I always tell them, then don't listen. You know, if you don't, yeah, why, don't fucking listen. why does it matter to you so much? Like, why do you, why do you care? Like, you just come on my Facebook, you don't even, like, you can just, like, start talking shit about rumors and things that don't, that are 15 years old. And have been disproven by now and yet why you know like it i you don't i don't take away anything from your favorite bands my music doesn't take away from that person's favorite bands it doesn't take away from your life and at all i'm just doing what i can do to the best of my ability and if you don't like it don't listen when you when you made it public that you were lesbian mm -hmm. did, did you really was did the divisiveness start there did you know any kind of like oh wait things are getting kind of weird um, it started on, uh, I mean, I never like, it was like, hello, I'm a lesbian, <laughs> everybody, hide your women. Um, I didn't do that. I, I just, my girlfriend came out and visited me on OzFest one time and we mm. were, it was, you know, we already played our set. So, you know, on second stage, it's done by six o'clock or whatever. So we've got the rest of the day. So we were just, we'd gone to catering and we were just sitting out in a field somewhere, you know, cause that's all it is. It's all fields everywhere, you know? And so we were just sitting out in a field, just being girlfriends, just talking and eating and hanging out. And somebody took a photo. Uh, I don't remember this, like MTV was still big and all that kind of stuff, mm. you know? So somebody took a photo of us and um, it got out. And then I had, randos coming up and saying hey uh, so you like girls and i uh, i said yeah a random person said that to you. yeah and i they were someone in that was in authority they were like a show buyer and mm. uh i said yep i do and they're like i do too and i said great we got something in common <laughs> and he goes well do you want a third and i said no 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 you're misunderstanding. What you watch on Pornhub is not real life. Like you're not gonna walk into my house and like see my girlfriend walking around in a towel and we're gonna be like, oh my God, a man. Like that's just what we needed. Like that's just not what happens. It's like some like, dude comes over to your house and is like, hey, here's your hot girlfriend. Like let's, you need a third? I mean, what, how yeah, would you act? beat him up. Right, exactly, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, what am I, how am I supposed to react to that? Yeah. So I just, politely go no i don't and you know i like women the way you like women and i like and i like men the way you like men and mm -hmm. you know and the 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 strange thing is that i also got like a lot of you know i wrote men aside in the first record and that's mm -hmm. about predators and rapists and pedophiles and all that but then mm -hmm. i get like all these these um i got awarded the um, psychopath of the century award by a men's rights group um who i said you're defending pedophiles and rapists and predators and groomers and that's uh, sex traffickers that's what you're doing no mm -hmm. no 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 you hate men i was like no i i have i have a bunch of brothers who are my best friends and my whole band is male my agent is male my lawyer's male um my bus driver i mean what are you talking about like it doesn't mean mm -hmm. you know well you just don't like me no i i don't know you so how can i dislike you but mm -hmm. i look at you like uh, a ken doll you know i don't notice anything below the waist this is not in me you know just like mm -hmm. i guess you would probably as a man you would look at other men like you would probably don't think like what that what that guy what it feel like if that guy mounted me right now you know like mm -hmm. like what they doesn't even enter my mind you know um and the other thing that i think people misconstrue is that i've had deep deep relationships with men um that were not sexual but they were intimate 
and that's mm-hmm. it, it, there was an in, uh, um, an emotional intimacy there, mm-hmm. um, and we connected through art or 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 something, uh, activism, something like that. And it's it, I became really close. You know, I mean, in some regards, in the emotional intimacy was even more than like, you know, these uh, you know. Some of the gay for a day or gay for Otep girls, you know, like they, mm-hmm. uh, they, it, that, they meant more to me than the sex did, you know, like mm-hmm. w- when I had with women, you know, it's like it, it was a really meaningful relationship. And um, I still have some with, with men like that. It's just people have this idea that you either are, you know, you either are straight or gay or you're not or it's a choice. And I'm like, it's mm-hmm. not a choice. Like, when did you choose to be straight? Because then if you're mm-hmm. saying it's a choice, then you can also choose to be gay. And I can hook you up with any number of, you know, well, when my brother was alive. I could hook you up with any of his friends, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not a choice, you know. And, like, people will come back and say, oh, when I saw my my uh, second grade teacher's boobs or I know when I noticed her boobs or something like that, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, same, same, you know. It just, it's a... Um, it's not. I didn't choose to have freckles. I didn't choose to have blonde hair. I didn't choose to be this badass, and I didn't choose to be gay. You know, it's like, what? How would? How did? Uh, this is just weird thinking for that. Now, luckily, it's yeah. a lot of that's changed. Even in um, the aggressive music genre, it's changing, and that's good. That's good. We're seeing progress. Um, some of the louder voices want us to regress. You know, yeah. and that's okay. That's what usually happens when a movement is dying. They start to scream. They start to get louder and louder yeah. and louder. And it's up to us who are trying to move things forward and be more progressive and more accepting and, mm-hmm. and more diverse to be louder than those that are, you know, diminishing beneath our boots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, everyone is, is just getting really loud right now. Everybody. Yes. Especially in some of the in the red states. And we played a lot of those red states. And I was ex- I was expecting to get... Because that was when um, a lot of the militias and stuff were going around and they were protesting drag shows. And, and uh, if you weren't – if you in, in certain states, if you didn't dress according to your biological um, gender, then you could be arrested. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I was – I called my lawyer and I said, well, what about me? I don't dress – I dress in – like I wear tank tops and – yeah, Adidas pants and sneakers. Like, what is that? Is that feminine enough for? Am I gonna get arrested? And he's like, I don't know. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just go see what happens. Hmm. So I did, and I didn't. You know, uh, but I was, I was hoping that they'd show up. I was really hoping they'd show up. I enjoy. It. I, I, there's a part of me that really enjoys having discourse, honest discourse or dishonest hmm. discourse, depending on where it's going, sure. with people that are bigots or who have that that sort of very limited thinking. Because yeah. they're puddles, you know. And once you get, once you smash a puddle, boom, you're just left with muck. And there's not left, there's not a whole lot you can do with muck, mm-hmm. you know, other than just, you know, uh, wipe it off your shoe. So uh, this is where people get, I think, this thing about me where like, oh, well, she's comparing herself to the ocean and she's calling these other people puddles. Well, that's the way I feel. I mean, I'm being honest. That's the way I feel. You want to be a puddle and you want to go up against the ocean? Be my guest. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when um, we played somewhere in Florida, and there was a bunch of um, conservatives who were protesting across the street, uh, and it was right where Target was, you know, and like on the road, it's like Target. Oh man, let's go to Target, you know, uh, buy something, get some, get off the bus. And uh, they all, as soon as I came across the street, they all just descended upon me, and each one was there for a different reason and they were all barking at me for different things you know you're a communist you're a socialist so i can't be both because those are competing ideologies um oh you're this you're that you're this and so then i just started arguing with each one Mm. and then i had them and by arguing with each one or debating each one depending on how you want to say it then they started to argue with each other and once they started to argue with each other i left oh my goodness that's sick yeah and so when i got back (laughs) they were all gone after I was done, I was like, see, that's how you can, because a lot of these people, don't, they, they're all there for different reasons, you know, mostly. Yeah. It's either taxes or the this or that or this, social movements, or it's the smaller government, or it's about, you know, cultural issues and things. And if you can get them arguing amongst themselves, then you don't have to, they do your job for you. So you just, I just leave. <laughs> kind of sounds like YouTube comments. 
Oh, or, oh my God! Or yeah, I, I don't even, I don't even read YouTube don't, comments. Nope. Don't I read don't. any comments or blabbermouth. Yeah, I don't read there either, them either. No, because it, because it, it seeps in your psyche. It just kind of just gets in there. I just feel like, and also I just feel like, who are you people? Like, you know, you mm. just like, because uh, I'll have people tell me like, you know, this, 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 this about a band, and I'm like, right, what band are you in? How about you, sh you, you? Oh, I don't have one. Okay, start a band in this climate. Mm. Start a band, and. Write write ten songs. I'll give you eleven because that's what they norm. That's normally what record companies are doling out now. Eleven. Um, I always do more, even though I don't get paid for it because I think the fans deserve more than eleven songs. But whatever. Um, I said, you write ten songs. Show me how it's done. Go out, have a twenty year career. Write mm -hmm. nine albums worth of material, and those are the only the songs that made it. I've written more than, you know, however many songs I've written that have made it onto a record. Um, and then I'll listen to your point of view. But until then, I, I you you know, it's like you're telling me the sky's purple. I don't it's not, so I don't care, you know. It's it doesn't it doesn't really bother me that much. Sometimes I'll go on if I do go onto a YouTube and people are are being just rude or whatever, I'll just be like I'll just leave a little snide comment or something funny, you know, just mm -hmm. to like fuck with them. And they it, they lose their energy real quick after that, you know. Mm -hmm. Or say something really nice back. Yeah, this like thank you for the constructive criticism. I'll I'll consider that really next time nice. from a stranger that I didn't ask for your opinion at all. But thank you, you know. <laughs> and that's part of what you have to learn when you get in to the music industry is that you know you're gonna have critics. You're gonna have people who don't know anything about music but have an opinion, you know. And everybody mm -hmm. has that. And that's what you know they used to call them armchair quarterbacks. People never played football, but they, mm -hmm. you know, can want to tell the coach how to coach the team or the quarterback yeah. who to throw to and all that. You're not always gonna have these people who think they know more than the people that actually do it and um i just i just like i said i it's like telling me that you know the sky's purple it isn't so i'm not worried about it or it's not flat i'm not worried about it you know mm -hmm. it's it's just doesn't it doesn't bother me it used to uh, quite a bit yeah i used to i used to think like what am i doing wrong because i did like i didn't know anything about music so what am i doing wrong now because after i wrote Sevis Shaw, i wrote house of secrets and house of secrets was a concept record and mm -hmm. it's vastly different than Seven Straw, you mm -hmm. know, R really, really different. And so people came, a lot of my fans, actually, even, who love Seven Straw, hated House of Secrets. Really? Hated it. Now, Why? they love it. They love it. They're like, why, why aren't you playing Buried Alive? Why aren't you playing that live? And I'm like, I thought you guys hated the record. Like, I know, I know you. I know you. I, saw, I, I remember your name. You're, I remember your name. And uh, Why they hate it? I, because it was it wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't Seven Straw, you know. It wasn't. Mm. Most of my albums are different. Each each. I don't want to write the same record every time. Mm -hmm. There are some bands where you could play me their most recent record and their first record, and I think I can't tell you which song is which. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and that's okay for some people. That's what they do, and that's fine. Um, but for me, I just get bored, and I always want to, you know, progress or challenge myself and, and write something new, you know, every mm -hmm. time. And so that's what I try to do anyway. You have, you, uh, from the first record to the, to the second one, you probably, you, you and the band probably had an insane probably year and a half too. Yeah. And like, like what were your relationships, relationships like with Moke and, uh, Evil Jane Rob at that, at that point? Uh, well, that's let's a, see. That, that's a lot to take in. It is. I know that one uh, one of the musicians came on the bus one time and said, I'm going to have a shirt made that says, no, I don't know where Otep is. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that them always want, getting an autograph and then someone asking, where's Otep? I think that affected them, mm. their it's ego. It's tough. So by the time we went in to write House of Secrets, there was, I think there was already a building resentment. Oh, no. Yeah, so... Luckily, we worked with this great producer who's gone on to like gigantic fame now. He's he's doing musicals and movies and stuff now. His name's Greg Wells, um, and he he'd worked with the Deftones before. And that's Terry actually recommended him, and so did my A and R who recommended Terry. So I trusted him, and I'm glad I did because Greg is he's a multi instrumentalist, and he's just he's an amazing he he becomes part of the band. He's just one mm -hmm. of those producers, you know. He just 
eats everything up, listens to everything, reads your, you know, reads your lyrics just to try to understand, like absorb it, be a part of the energy and in the room. And, and so uh, when we started writing House of Secrets and I had all these just, just different wild ideas that I wanted to do for that record, uh, some of the musicians, they, they didn't want to, they didn't want to do it. So um, uh, two of them left and uh, the drummer and the guitar player left and uh, so we had, um, rest in peace, we had a, a Joey Jordison from Slipknot came mm-hmm. in and played five songs on my second album. And that was like incredible. And I was like, holy shit, like I got Joey in here, you know, and I was such a fan, you know. But he was so sweet and such, and, and no ego at all. Like he sat in that drum room, he's like, how was that? You know, did I do good? Is that okay? <laughs> did you guys like it? We're like, oh my God, we loved it. Um, and so I, I think at that, and then Greg played a lot of, you know, Greg uh, stepped in and played a lot of, of, of the guitar parts and the bass player stepped in and played a lot of the guitar parts as well. And, and we ended up just, you know, making this, I think it was my first concept album, really. So um, I, it's one of my favorite albums. And now it's everybody else's favorite, too. So that's when I learned at that point to just stop listening to people mm-hmm. and just follow your creative instincts. Wherever the muses lead you, you go. And um, if you believe it, then other people will believe it. They'll know mm-hmm. if you're faking it. They'll know if you're doing it for just for other reasons. You know, people call it sellout. It was like a big deal, like in the old days. Like, oh, you just a sellout. Sold out. You sold out. Yeah, I sell out clubs. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I sell out shows, man. But um, I, I just decided, you know, at this point, you know, I'm, I, I'm, what I'm doing is honest. You know, what mm-hmm. I, at least to me it is. Uh, Everything that I write comes from a, a, a deep, dark place in my soul and my heart. And um, it, when I, if I bring it to life on a record, then it's meaningful to me. And uh, I remember when I wrote um, Apex Predator off a Hydra album, which is only my second. I did that's my second concept album I ever did. Apex Predator is kind of like a goth rap kind of song, and um, the band at the, the band I had at the time hated it, and they were just like nobody. The, no one's gonna like this. It's not metal, you know. Oh and I'm just, goodness. just wait, just yeah. wait. First show we did on the tour, every fan, there was a pit. There was every fan knew the words. They were singing along, and it was amazing. Same thing when I wrote Equal Rights, Equal Lefts. Um, that has like a trap beat in it, you know. It's in threes, you know. I am a pariah, and every, you know, it's like it's 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 not your typical like, you know, metal song. It's not mm-hmm. really at all. It's a it's it's and that actually happened to me. It's based on a true story. Um, I, I got I, I went to uh, Hawaii on a. <laughs> uh, I took my girlfriend at the time to uh, Hawaii for our anniversary. I'm one of these uh, romantic, sensitive types. It's like, oh, it's our three month anniversary. We should celebrate. It's our six month anniversary. We should celebrate. Um, and so uh, I think it was our six month anniversary. We went to Hawaii, and uh, we just got done surfing. And some guy comes over. I just feel this big paw on my shoulders. I'm trying to get my my um, my surf suit off, my wetsuit off, and and uh, I turn around, and there's this guy there. He's an older guy. He's got this big pompadour type hair do, and uh, little man boobs, little belly. Looked like he'd been working out with like 15 pound weights, uh, dumbbells for a long time because he had a little bit of little little little, little uh, bicep area, but Sick. skipped leg day for like 35 years. So he's like you know little sticks, and just sun baked man. I mean just sun baked. And he goes. Um, he goes, oh, happy Father's Day. And I said, and it was Father's Day. So I was like, oh, thanks. I'll tell my dad. He goes, oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. I thought you were a man. And I was like, and that's a, that's, that's a very typical thing for like straight guys to say. Because he'd saw me and her like kiss after we'd got done mm. surfing, you know, for our anniversary. And so um, <laughs> he, I said, uh, he's like, oh, I thought you were a man. I was like, oh, don't worry about it, dude. I was like, I saw the man titties on you, and I thought you were a woman. I was going to tell you that the topless beach is down the street, you know. <laughs> so sick. he's like, oh, you got some mouth on you, huh? And I said, well, you're going to go ask her. She'll tell you. And then he goes, ah, you're one of those. I said, one of yeah. those. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And I didn't know what he meant, but I was like, yeah, I'm one of those. I'm exactly one of those. So he took a step back and he brought up his right hand. He goes, so you believe in equal rights, huh? So I was, so I, I used to box. And uh, so I took my stance and I put my left hand up and I go, yeah, and I believe in equal lefts too. 
And then we stood there for a second, just staring at each other. And then he walked away and got it on his like old man motorcycle and, you know, <laughs> drove away. He had like the big saddlebags and all that. Supposed to be like cop motorcycle, but he wasn't a cop. By that time, all of the surf instructors come running over like, what's up, Utep? What happened? What happened? And I'm like, I don't know. That guy fucking was fucking with me. And then they said, uh, oh, shit, him. And I, I, they were, I was like, what? And they're like, oh, we'll leave it to you to pick the one guy that nobody will fuck with on the beach. And I don't know if he's like former, like was in the mob or something. I have no idea. But like nobody, like the surf instructors are all tough guys. Like they were, they wouldn't mess with him. Really? Yeah. And they just let him drive. They just, he just drove off. So I was like, okay, whatever. But yeah, so when I wrote that song, mm -hmm. same thing. Band was like, oh no, no one's going to like this song. No one's going to like it. And we get out there and uh, sure enough. First, we I said this. Put your fists in the air. The song goes out to everybody that believes in equality. Everybody cheers, and then I say the song's called Equal Rights, Equal Lefts. Whole place erupts. Song comes in with the Inception horns that, bah! and then we just start going in, and then uh, the everybody's headbanging, they're grooving, pits going, and they're singing along, and then as soon as we get to the chorus, equal rights, equal lefts, fight for your rights, and then everybody's just fists up, pounding, and it was just this amazing, and after the show was over, I was like, see, <laughs> they like it, you know, because, and I, I try to tell like a lot of younger bands, like, don't be afraid, don't lock yourself into a genre, you mm -hmm. know, if you feel it, play it, and when you go on stage, feel it, because if you feel it, the audience will mm -hmm. recognize that you feel it and they'll respect you for it whether they like the song or not they'll respect you for it mm -hmm. give it everything you got uh, as long as you believe in it you know and that's been what i've done you know my whole career like if i believe in it i'm gonna do it you you believe what you say you say it you believe what what you're right and you, you perform it on stage you're the whole the whole thing mm -hmm. I, th I think the way you are off stage also affects the way you are on you know which i yeah that's true. Yeah. yeah. Just fucking throw down everywhere. Yeah, man. I mean, I don't, I, you know, that's, that's also a, a thing that I don't, you know, um, I'm not, I'm territorial. I'm not, I'm not a, um, I'm not a bully. I hate bullies, in fact. So if I see somebody that's out and about and picking on somebody or they try to come at me, because a lot of times they will, they'll come at women in, in aggressive ways. And, um, you know, I'm usually... I, I try to put them in like this. I'm not the one. This is the wrong. I'm the wrong one to be fucking with right now. Like just go find somebody else or don't, you know, but this is not a safe uh, exercise for you. <laughs> uh, That's a good one. This is not going to end up how you think. This is I not. promise. And uh, so it's, that's just me, man. You know, I am who I am. Maybe in a weird way that, that that's helped you just really cultivate thick skin. Sure, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways it has to. I mean, especially when you grow up really poor and, you know, we went to like a mixed mixed schooling where like kids were really, really wealthy or middle class or working mm -hmm. class. And we were like the lower working class, poverty class. So we're like buying our clothes at, at, at Goodwill and, you know, Army Navy surplus or hand-me-downs for my older brothers. And, mm -hmm. and so you go to school and you get picked on a lot for that because, you know, kids are cruel and they're going to pick on whatever uh, they can. And I've had this deep voice since I was four years old. I was the big bad wolf in my kindergarten play for the fifth graders because mm -hmm. no one else had the deepest, I had the deepest voice in the school. But um, I think that also, you know, there's a lot of things they can take from you, you know, but uh, the way I was raised, but they can't take away your dignity and they can't take away your self-respect unless you let them. And no one's taken that away from me ever. And that's the way I've lived my life. That's what's up. Yeah. One last question. Uh, what do you think is, because you're, you're, the, you're the perfect person to ask, what do you think is missing in metal today oh. <laughs> i'm ready <laughs> i know you are no, well I, I mean i mean i run really fast i'm ready to run <laughs> this is nice who gave this to you is it yours our our bandwagon driver uh oh, Ro nice. rolling cloud he's a native oh excellent do you know what tribe x, x what addict, nation uh no uh, x addict uh so, sober now oh so fantastic. great great pure hearted guy yeah right on um I'm sorry, what's missing from... Metal today. Metal. Uh, geez, I just, you know, uh, what's great is that uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews and podcasts since, um, since the, uh, the new record's coming out, and everyone's like, you know, new metal's coming back out. New metal's coming. It's, it's you know, I was just mm -hmm. at some festival, and there's all these new bands, and everybody's doing new metal again, and I'm like, great. 
you know, because I thought that was one of the most exciting times in music because there was, you know, I was talking about the Deftones before, like the Deftones have a DJ, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you, you, one of the most exciting dynamic bands in the world also has a DJ who's cutting tracks in the back, you know? Uh, same thing with Slipknot, you know, they got a DJ, they got a guy that plays um, keys, they got, they got, you know, three percussionists, they've got, uh, they got a guy that plays samples. I mean, it's, it was just an exciting time because you could just bring in, it was like fusion bands, you know, you could mm. just bring in all of your inspirations. And that's what I try to, whenever, if, if I ever get asked uh, from new bands, local bands, whatever, you know, what can we do? And I'm like, listen to, don't just listen to your genre. I mean, of course, study your genre if that's what you, the music you love, but listen to other things, you know, you might get inspired by it, you know, uh, some of my favorite guitar players also are flamenco players, you know, and they play with their fingernails and, you know, but they can also like shred like nobody's business, you know. Um, and uh, especially uh, I think, you know, I try to tell them like, you know, just open your mind to different types of music and different inspirations and, and you know, s singers read more than you write. That's just, you know, that's just a common law for writers you know you always read more than you write mm. fill your mind with words but I, I think that um as far as you know for me um I wish I had more opportunities to play uh than just headlining all the time I wish I wish I had that unfortunately that just isn't going to be I don't think that's ever going to change for me so um and that's okay I'm just going to keep doing what I do um, but as far as music is concerned, what's missing, um, I mean, what we're seeing now with the, with the, the diversity and the, and the progress and people owning um, what they say and what they're doing, I think it's great. And uh, I hope to see more of that. Cool. Yeah. Well, Otep, uh, it was an honor to actually hang out with you. Yeah, man. It's you know, good. It's good badass. Yeah. <laughs> this is my life. This is <laughs> <laughs> mine. Sure. Yeah. Me sitting across from Chris from Suicide Silence. Oh it's my rad. goodness! It's badass. It's so man. crazy. So, yeah. so the new record came out uh, on the fifteenth, right? It did. Cool. September fifteenth. Yeah. The what made you actually? Well, okay, one, one, one more. Uh, what made you? Nine uh, more questions. Okay, nine okay. more. What made you cover the uh, Eminem song? Uh, well, Mr. Mathers has been a big inspiration for me as far as a lyricist and just his cadence and everything. And honestly, that was the hardest song for me to, to cover vocally as a vocalist. Why? Uh, his timing is just so wild. He'll start on a three and end on a four and then start on a two and end on a one. I mean, it's, mm. it's, it's just, he has just this incredible. And so I think also a lot of the things that we've discussed today about, you know, um, I am whatever you say I am, you know, I, and, and if, and, and if I wasn't, then why would I say I am, you know, that, that, those lyrics, I, every song that I covered on this album started from a lyrical perspective. Can mm -hmm. I relate? And what we were talking about before with genres, I think so many people lock themselves into a genre that they're that even if the song would be meaningful to them, they wouldn't listen because mm -hmm. oh no, it's, that's pop music or yeah. you know, uh, and even outside of our genre, like people won't listen to aggressive music oh because it's too heavy, it's too heavy. So when I covered Olivia Rodrigo, you know, and I I, I did I did uh, alter the the lyrics just a little bit to reflect my life. I did that with a lot of the songs as well. Um, no one, most, a lot of my fans might not listen to Olivia Rodrigo, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but the song itself has a great message and great lyrics. And um, I, so for me, it was about, it's a, it was about choosing songs that meant something to me that I thought my fans could also find meaning in and would be beneficial to them, to their ears. And uh, it's like what we did with the Beach Boys, California Girls, you know, that's like a beach pop surf song from the early 60s but i'm a tr big true crime person so i was like i just finished watching some documentaries on like ted bundy and you know all these different serial killers and then i uh, was looking through different songs to cover and i came across california girls and i started reading the lyrics and i was like whoa if you take out the da, 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 you know you take all that out and you just read what he's saying wow that's dark this is a guy that is objectifying women all over the country at least that's how I read it. Maybe that's not mm -hmm. how the original writer intended it, but the way I read it, this guy's dissecting women throughout all over the country mm -hmm. and wants to build the perfect woman and he wants to put them in his hunting ground, California. You know, and so interesting. And so when I when I when yeah, so when I wrote the song, I wanted it to be dark. I wanted it to have some sort of like you know, uh, sexual obsession to it, but and I wanted to sing it from the person that wrote it, so it has this kind of like 
obsession, seduction, darkness to it. Maybe it's a little sexy in a very, very dark way, but also dangerous in a very important way. And so that's, that's why I chose that song. But every song, every song. Somebody asked me why I chose Territory Pissings uh, from Nirvana instead of covering like Heart Shaped Box or whatever. And I'm like, well, mm. I, everybody covers that, you know. And, uh, yeah. But also I like a lot of Nirvana's B-side stuff or, or their lesser known stuff. And Territory Pissings is amazing. It's like a true punk rock song. And, you know, we just beefed it up just a little bit. We didn't have to do a whole lot to that one. I've added some things in the bridge, but other than that is... It was that, but um, yeah, and then the Billie Eilish song, same thing, you know, and just on down, and then Pet, and then Lil Peep, and I mean, we just, we, you know, we did, uh, we just, like I said, I just went in on whatever songs meant something to me. The label wanted me to cover like hair metal bands, and I was like, I, why? I don't. I think they like hair metal bands, mm. and I was like, I don't. So I'm either, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it my way. Because it was it was a COVID deal. They actually came to me and said, Hey, we want you to do a cover record, and I'd never mm -hmm. done one before. I'd, I'd covered songs in the past, but mm -hmm. never did a cover album. So they said they wanted eight cover. I said, I I, I don't want to do a whole cover record. They said, okay, eight eight covers and three originals, mm. or two originals. And I said, well, I'll do three, and then I put my brother's voicemail at the very end. So that's smart. Yeah. Now, now it's in it's in your music forever. Yeah, it is a lifetime. Yeah, man. Well, Otep, again, it was great to hang out with you. Yeah. I'm honored. I, I appreciate your time. Uh, my man. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, I'm everywhere, pretty much. If you, I'm on Facebook, Otep Official, Instagram. I have not really much on Twitter anymore because it's garbage it's, yeah, uh, it's a, toxic yeah it's a <laughs> it's a dumpster fire now dumpster uh, fire i'm on i'm on threads and uh but mainly uh you know just the you, I'm, on, uh, I'm on i don't really mess around with tiktok too much but i have a tiktok account uh, but yeah uh, pretty much facebook instagram threads that's where you'll find me otep official on all of them cool oh well, and check out the new record just came out last week and uh yeah that's it appreciate it later